keeping with Chevron's tradition of service throughout the 20th century, the people of Chevron bring you this program in support of public television. I'm Bill Moyers. The 1920s have long been a puzzle to me. I was born in 1934, and in the movies I saw growing up and in the popular literature I read, the 1920s was the decade not to have missed. Charming, crazy days, people said. The good old days, lamented people looking back from the pit of the Depression. We Americans are prone to create our legends too quickly, and we did so with the 1920s, because the cardinal sins of that era, which so captivated the mythmakers, were only part of the story. In our popular collective memory, the 1920s was the decade that brought America into the automobile age, when everyone, it seemed, drove a Model T Ford. It was a decade for heroes and celebrities in sports, in the movies, and in personal accomplishments that caused us to respond with admiration and awe. It was a time of prohibition, speakeasies, and gangsters, and of high fashion. The Roaring Twenties, they were called, and the decade did roar. But it was also a time of hard work for millions and of prejudice against radicals, labor, and blacks. It was this other side of the 20s, the unromantic side, that didn't square in my mind with the popular images. I knew from the recollections of my own parents that for many Americans, the 1920s were a time more of heavy squalls than of rainbows. My mother and father were married in 1926 in a farming community in southeastern Oklahoma. It no longer exists except for the little frame house into which they moved as a young couple. When they married, the nearest doctor lived some 50 miles away, and my parents had neither Model T, nor horse and buggy to reach him, nor the money to pay him if they got there. Twin girls died for lack of prenatal care, and pneumonia almost claimed their first son. So the popular memory of the 20s has to be reconciled with these kinds of personal experiences. This program is part of that effort. We'll revisit the 20s through some film of the time and through the memories of men and women who recall the old days, both bad and good. 20s to me were a delightful time because uh, there were no real responsibilities. And uh, it seemed as if the world was gonna run like this for a long while. I just characterized the 20s as the dream period of all time. Everything seemed to go great, and everybody seemed to look beautiful. It was decadence, I think, is the best way I could put it in one word. Everybody was, seemed to be rushing around, uh, hoping for uh, uh, riches and fame. Uh, they didn't care much how they got it. We were working so hard for so little that eventually, after 10 years of that, we produced a depression. Looking back today, the 1920s present us with two familiar faces, and we remember both as we would old friends from our youth. One friend was devil may care, always ready for a good time, always in step with the latest fashions, the decade of flappers, free love, bootleg hooch, and rum runners. The other friend was more old shoe, someone to spend a lazy Sunday afternoon with. For all their hard times, my parents still talk about those simple joys they shared after the long days in the fields, when the pinto beans stopped boiling on the old home comfort cook stove and friends and kinfolk gathered to play dominoes. On Saturday nights, they'd take turns at different houses, moving out of one room all the furniture except the oil lamp, and then singing and dancing to midnight to tunes like, Skip to my Lou, my darling. Many Americans who lived through the 20s remember the simple pleasures of life. We had just very small pleasures, going to the movies, going maybe on a Saturday night, a trip up the Hudson on the moonlight sail. We had the Victrola, records galore. People had nothing to do but uh, visit and talk and uh, loaf at the store, the cracker, uh, around these pot belly stoves in the wintertime and out in the shade in the summertime. We went to Gray's Drug Store and went downstairs and got cheap theater tickets and sat up in the peanut gallery and saw a show. And after the show was over, we'd go into Schraff's 
have a soda. And then we'd walk home. You know, New York uh, was so small town at that time that you never had any fear that you couldn't walk. What gave the 20s their excitement, however, was novelty, the hot spice to life's casserole. Americans, even as they enjoyed the old pleasures, eagerly embraced the new. For the first time in our history, women's bodies came into public view. The Miss America pageant began as a resort promotion at Atlantic City in 1921. Soon, any excuse sufficed for a beauty contest, like this chiropractor's perfect back contest. Under the fluff, a message. Victorianism was dead. Americans went wild over races, too. It was a decade of overactivity. There was an enormous amount of, of just getting from one place to the other. It was mostly action, a great deal of action. Sometimes the action didn't require speed, but stamina. The uh, marathon dancing was the craze, and, and it really was. <laughs> it was kind of crazy. Marathon dancing was blamed for some deaths by overexertion before its own collapse. But the symbolic dance of the decade was pure energy, a whirlwind of flying arms and legs, the Charleston. She danced the Charleston, which I still think is one of the best dances ever originated. And then there was the ultimate Charleston, a thousand feet high, going nowhere at 90 miles an hour. It was a decade of hijinks everywhere. Everyone seemed to be clowning around. Mary Pickford and Douglas Fairbanks on a golf course. And Babe Ruth in a gymnasium. Fashion is a frivolous but accurate mirror of social change, too. During the decade, America saw more and more of a new woman, literally, as necklines plunged and hemlines climbed. By 1927, the female badges of freedom were exposed knees and a cigarette in hand. Or a cocktail. Legend gives a name to these women of the 20s, flappers. F. Scott Fitzgerald once described an ideal flapper as lovely and expensive and about 19. And there are other definitions as well. She was somebody who uh, strapped down her bosom and who made herself as much as she could look like she grew straight up and down. The very short dress uh, and long beads, it was a sort of a, a, a style that uh, was called flapper. The shorter the skirt, the flappier the flapper. A flapper, a girl that went out with all the men. Who sought to uh, bring men to their bedrooms uh, by, uh, for funds and things of that sort. Some people may have thought that she came from the ancient profession, but that is not true at all. She was just a gay kid who uh, liked to dance and would go to the parties. The girls that were flappers, of course, everybody looked up to them because they were the perfect thing, you know. One fuel for all that restless motion was alcohol. Prohibition, begun in 1920, made drinking a crime and did cut average consumption of alcohol by a third. Yet prohibition also turned millions of ordinary Americans into lawbreakers. Some nasty, wicked eyes would peer out. And you would say, uh, I am uh, Ruth Gordon. And he'd say, uh, never heard of you. And the man would come to the door and he'd say, uh, who, who? In other words, who sent you? And he'd say, uh, George or Benny or whoever. And we'd go to Sardi's and dear Mr. Sardi, not Vincent, but his pa, Dear Mr. Sardi, you'd say, I, uh, I think I'll uh, uh, have a, uh, uh, 
he'd say, uh, uh, and I'd say, uh, yeah, uh hmm And then he'd bring a, a cup, a coffee cup, with uh, brandy and soda, or uh, whiskey and soda. And uh, uh, the, the, the great thing, everybody made gin in the bathtub. Uh, some people made needle beer, they called it. They'd put it in cakes and inject it with ether. Uh, then you had all sorts of home brew that was made. And this is a great big thing. We used to make rum. He used to buy all kinds of stuff, and he used to make it in the basement. And uh, we used to, that was for our own, for our own use. My dad has bought some homemade sakes, which is rice wine, and which we consume at our home. It's a very easy to make, I understand. So the most of the Japanese family didn't make garan or two occasionally. With Prohibition came another development. That was almost the beginning of gangsterism in this country because the stakes were so huge. That rum running and speakeasies and bootlegging and all sorts of things like that did go on. The gangsters were everywhere in Chicago in the 20s. We used to pass a hotel the 22nd and then in Michigan, I think it was. A big hotel there where everybody knew. What's his name? Capone. That was his headquarters. The notorious Al Capone, who killed off his rivals. Federal agents conducted regular raids on bootleg operations. On the high seas and on land but federal forces were undermanned and corruption was common. Despite all the rage, there was liquor to be had in the 20s, plenty of it. But that disguises another side to life that was anything but glamorous. In the country, farmers, even with machine help, still struggled with the soil. In the cities, recent immigrants and our own native poor still live shoulder to shoulder in tenements. We lived six people in um, four small rooms. I slept on a um, cot in the kitchen. And work for most Americans was hard and tedious. You really worked for the time that you were at your desk. The supervisors were sort of strict. We obeyed them and there was no answering back. When we worked in the 1920s, it was 10 hours a day, no overtime pay, and we worked hard. We'd kill cattle and hogs. We'd have six or 700 hogs a day, 150 to 200 cattle a day. I had to learn to break legs with a knife. My own father can still describe vividly what it's like to chop cotton from sunup to sundown or to sleep on the wagon all night at the cotton gin in order to be the first in line to have the cotton weighed early in the morning. Recently, I went back with him to Oklahoma to where one of the cotton gins stood and he talked about the time he got his hand caught in the machinery and lost part of two fingers. He was back in the fields the next day. Like most people, he puts aside the painful memories to cherish the happy ones. For a while, that's what the country did with the 20s. The new mass medium, the movies, emerged to provide us with the images of that era which ignored the routine and ordinary for the novel and colorful. If any medium can be credited with changing how we Americans saw ourselves and our world, it was the movies. We went to the movies a couple of times, twice a week. For sure, Saturdays, that was the show. That was a nickel show at those days. I can remember Douglas Fairbanks. Whenever a Douglas Fairbanks movie came out, we turned down. The movies turned actors and actresses into national celebrities. Mary Pickford, lovable and innocent, became America's sweetheart. And when in real life she shed her curls, that was major news. Not all our stars traded on sweetness. Some traded on their sexuality. And here is the male love god and sex symbol, Rudolph Valentino, the Sheik of Araby, who became the fantasy lover of millions of American women. 
we went to see Rudolf Valentino. And uh, he danced in person with his wife. And when he got through, Ru uh, Rudolf Valentino and his wife, the ladies were throwing diamonds on the stage, notes, anything they could have, they were thrown up there. They loved him so much. And he was grand. The advent of sound gave motion pictures a new dimension, one that fascinated all Americans, from this Chicago garment worker. We wanted to be one of the first to see him, to hear it. That was to see somebody talk in the movies. <laughs> that was a lot of fun. To the president of the United States, Calvin Coolidge. So let me admit that in helping to make the amazing record, which is to be produced of this scene, I have only the most general idea of what it is, mechanically and scientifically, that is being done. But I am assured that a photo film of this scene is to be produced, combining a record both for the eye and the ear, a record that may be described as a speaking, moving picture. Motion pictures also revolutionized news coverage. These scenes from universal newspaper newsreels of the 20s could just as easily be seen today, from this mass demonstration of Japanese school children to the polar bears who took a dip in frosty Lake Michigan at two below. Then, as now, stunts made news. This fella planned to roll a hoop from Texas to New York City. And here is the Goliath of Argentina, a boxer of Italian parentage. The caption and the pictures reinforced an ethnic stereotype that fortunately wouldn't pass an editor today. We have made some progress after all. As for our own sports figures, the nation paid homage to those men and women who played games superbly. Babe Ruth appealed to all of us kids because uh, he could hit that baseball farther than we could. He also did it left-handed, which uh, seemed to make it more difficult and interesting. In our adulation of athletes, they assumed mythic proportions. In golf, there was the great Bobby Jones. In tennis, there was Helen Wills. Boxing gave us two giants of the ring, heavyweight champion Jack Dempsey, and Gene Tunney, who defeated him. Football gave us Red Grange, the galloping ghost, and Newt Rockney out of Notre Dame. Johnny Weissmuller was making swimming history, as was Gertrude Ederly, who became the first woman to swim the English Channel. On reaching shore, she said, I just knew if it could be done, it had to be done, and I did it. But it says something positive about America that its highest adoration went not to an athlete, but to an aviator, Charles Lindbergh, whose solo flight across the Atlantic in 1927 was a triumph of spirit and science. We thought a bird going over the ocean Oh, how did he do it? How, how much pep that man has to take a chance of going over the ocean? I remember sitting at home, just glued to the radio and following the news, and just ecstatic when we learned that he had landed safely. Lindbergh was mobbed in Paris, and when he arrived back in the United States, he was welcomed home by equally enthusiastic crowds and honored by President Coolidge. Lindbergh said the French had a message of affection for America and had given him this instruction. When you return to your country, take back with you this message from France and Europe to the United States of America. Well, thank you. In Charles Lindbergh, America in the 20s found its ultimate hero. His daring celebrated the rugged individualism of the past, and his technological skill promised a wonderful future in which that incredible machine would reign supreme. The Great War just ended had spurred the advance of machines, and it would spur the economy too. The profits of key industries during that slaughter in Europe meant huge sums for new investment when the war ended. 
So things were ripe to boom, and boom they did. We became a consumer society, and the visible evidence of this could be found in our homes with telephones, mix masters, the electric toaster, and the lightweight electric iron. And of course, on our streets and highways with the automobile. When Henry Ford declared that machinery is the new messiah, you could hear in the hum of the multitudinous factories a mighty chorus of hallelujahs. Henry Ford introduced his Model T in 1908 and the assembly line in 1910, but it was in the 20s that his assembly line swung into high gear. By 1925, a Model T was rolling off the line every 10 seconds. Ford sought standardization above all things. The customer can have a Ford any color he wants, so long as it's black. But Americans soon wanted colors other than black and different models, and got them from General Motors and other manufacturers. By 1929, American automakers were turning out close to 5 million cars a year. There were 26 million automobiles and trucks on the road, roughly one car per family. Even working people found a way to buy a car. As a tenant farmer, we're not wealthy. We're very poor. Uh, but we did have automobile. We did have automobile. There was a start, no limit. We could go as fast as we wanted. And we went fast. <laughs> In the 20s, too, electric light and power came to all but rural areas. For Americans, it meant the first appearance of appliances we now take for granted. These appliances were designed for women. Not much talk, then, of men sharing the drudgery of housework. Promotional films promised that women's work would be easier once she got electricity. With electricity came the telephone. Before the end of the decade, more than 10 million phones were in use. Of course, we had no dialing whatever. We took up the receiver and held it until we had a lovely female voice ask, number please. And there was another electrical miracle to send the human voice across the miles, radio. Our friends in, in the immediate neighborhood, you know, would come in of an evening and be entertained. It was a wonderful innovation. We loved it. The mass consumer society had indeed arrived. With it came, for many, a period of freewheeling, high living prosperity. It isn't as though I just want money. I just want to be extravagant. I didn't care about a five or a 10 or a hundred dollar bill. And that epitomized, that epitomized the 20s. I finally got making about a hundred a week. That was terrific. You see, I could, I never went any place. I wouldn't cross the street without getting a check or cab, you know. Everybody had one, two, three, four, five. And if you were terrific, you had right up to there. And they were just beautiful. Not just junky old diamond bracelets, but beautiful ones. The great bull market, the most frantic boom yet, hit its full stride in 1927. The old American gospel said, work hard and get rich. The new gospel said, pick those apples off those trees. Everybody who go out and play bridge, as they say, had two no trumps. Oh, by the way, did you buy any uh, Kennecott copper? No, I must buy some Kennecott copper. No, three uh, hearts. I was a $2 broker, which means that uh, as a member of the stock exchange, I went on the floor as an agent. One of the main reasons why the market was participated in by most anybody was that they had very low margin rules. If you bought $6,000 worth of stock, you only had to put up $600 worth. This seemed like a pretty good thing when everything was going up all the time. They always said that uh, you were getting six tips from your taxi driver every time you got into a cab, he'd tell you what to buy. And nobody seemed to much care what it was, just so uh, they had a name. I didn't know what I was buying. There was one called Eidig and Schilt. I don't know to this day what Eidig and Schilt was. And then they would go haywire on margin and really maybe clean up $25,000. Somebody who'd never had anything. This made them think that they were speculative geniuses. And then when it went down, you see, you had to cover, cover, cover. And when you couldn't cover, 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 and your jewels went to the pawn shop, and then you still couldn't cover, cover, it was all gone. It was gone, as we all know, in the crash of 29. But let's not forget, once again, how memory and fact can diverge. 
less than half of 1% of the population ever traded on margin. Most Americans wrestled with more mundane economics. I couldn't make enough money. On most jobs, I was making only about 25 cents an hour, 30 cents an hour, and uh, cost about 25 cents for a rather greasy meal in a greasy spoon restaurant. I wore patch pants, but so did the little white boy around the corner whose father owned the pharmacy. I think we were probably poor. Otherwise, why would I go to work for $10 a week out of uh, just a year and a half of high school? You will find economists today who believe that what brought on the Great Depression was a spectacular fall in consumer spending as the 20s ended. For those who had shared in it, the boom was going bust. And even with the new prosperity, half the country still lived in poverty. In one of the letters I treasure from my mother, there is this paragraph. In those days, we didn't even have radio, only the weekly newspaper. We heard that banks were going broke, and our parents were always scared to death the one that supported them would be the next. And once, it was. When the bank foreclosed on my grandparents' farm, my grandfather took a job in the cotton gin. My parents had been working the farm with him, so they had to leave too. Dad went to work on a crew helping to build a highway to Oklahoma City. He earned a dollar and 50 cents a day and felt lucky at that. The national economy was in serious trouble. Coal mining, to name just one industry, was depressed. Average unemployment for the decade was 30%. New England's textile and shoe factory started to shut down. The region stayed depressed through the decade. It was also a bad time for farmers, once our economic backbone. In 1921, farmers suffered a net loss of $6 billion, and they never really recovered. So millions of Americans, regardless of where they lived or at what they worked, did not fully share in the new consumer society. We don't have electricity. We relied upon the kerosene. We had gas light. So we didn't have any electrical fixtures or lights or anything like that. We had uh, uh, ice box. When the ice man did drive through there, we got ice. Otherwise, we went and got it. The ice man brought up a piece of ice every second day or so. The only appliance that, um, that we had in our house was, um, an, was an automatic um, washing machine. It was automatic because, you, because I was the guy that turned it. But it's a curious thing. Even those shut out of affluence remember a general air of contentment. People's standards and demands were not as high as they are today. Does one ever know when you're poor? Except it's fashionable now. But uh, with me, uh, we didn't consider ourselves poor. We were not well-to-do. It was years later before I made the staggering discovery that we're, we're pretty poor people. We always had plenty to eat and few pleasures, and we seemed very contented with what we had. A dollar would bring a, a dozen eggs, a, a pound of butter, a quart of milk, and a loaf of bread, a, and you got change. We could buy our essential, and I had pretty nice clothes, and we were happy with that. We were happy. Maybe what supported our people then was hope. Hope born of the expectation that things could and would get better. Born, too, of a new form of financing, the installment plan. If you didn't have money to buy what you wanted now, you could buy and pay for it later. The presidents of that time were optimists, too. Republican down to the cut of their suits. If they could keep wages and farm prices low, industry would prosper. For them, the business of America was business. In 1920, the Republicans nominated Warren Harding and Calvin Coolidge to run against Democrats James Cox and Franklin D. Roosevelt, who had been a popular assistant secretary to the Navy. Harding, who looked like a president should, spoke in platitudes, calling for a return to normalcy. He won by a two-to-one margin. But Harding was a man of many limitations. He once commented of himself, I can't hope to be the best president this country ever had, but I'd like to be the best loved. 
As a young man, his father once told him, It's a good thing you weren't born a girl. You'd be in the family way all the time. You can't say no. As president, Harding couldn't say no either. He much preferred poker to statecraft, and he preferred a friendly private drink and a chaw of tobacco, or the company of a woman not his wife, to the duties of office. He was a handsome fella and uh, pretty wicked. I was in, uh, very, very much impressed by the fact that uh, Warren G. Harding was such a handsome man and such an inept man. And the Harding administration, the, uh, uh, the belief was that they stole and sold the White House, furniture and all. <laughs> I figured he was a grafter like most of them. Harding's administration reeked of scandal. The best known, Teapot Dome, saw his interior secretary, Albert Fall, lease government oil reserves to private companies for large cash gifts. Fall was subsequently sent to jail for bribery. The burdens of the presidency proved too much for Warren Harding. I remember being awakened in the middle of the night by boys crying extra, extra, President Harding dead. So we, we got up and rushed out of the house and bought a copy of the extra. President Harding had indeed died. On Harding's death, Calvin Coolidge took the presidential oath from his father, a justice of the peace, at the family home in Vermont. Unlike the fun-loving Harding, Coolidge was taciturn, unsmiling, dour. Of him was said, he must have been weaned on a pickle. Of him was written, he aspired to become the least president the country has ever had, and he attained his desire. He was very quiet, a do-nothing. <laughs> he was a tight mouth one. We called him Silent Cal. He was called during those days. Yet Coolidge's silence was calculated. He knew that the nation liked the image of a prudent Yankee squire at the head of the table. We felt pretty good uh, about his uh, quiet hand being on the teller of the ship of state. He thought Washington should interfere with business as little as possible. With his secretary of the treasury, Andrew Mellon, he considered that the rich were the creators of prosperity. He once said, a man who builds a factory builds a temple. The country re-elected Silent Cal, who served four more years and could have had another term. But he sprang a surprise. And then he said, I don't choose to run again. He didn't want it anymore. Instead, Coolidge went fishing, often wearing high, stiff collars. He let others bait the hook and unhook the fish. All he did was hold the rod. Few presidents entered office with a more awesome reputation than did Herbert Hoover. He was a self-made millionaire engineer. In the First World War, he served as food administrator. Later, he headed the American Relief Administration. In 1921, he dispatched nearly a million tons of food to the Soviet Union, which was on the verge of famine. In the 1928 campaign, Hoover ran as an Iowa farm boy made good. His opponent, Governor Al Smith of New York. Smith's mannerisms offended rural America. His ambivalence on prohibition offended the drives. And most crucial, his Catholicism offended much of Protestant America. One leading Protestant minister warned, no governor can kiss the papal ring and get within gunshot of the White House. Hoover swamped Smith. Within less than a year, however, his presidency was engulfed by the stock market crash of 1929 and the ensuing depression. Hoover, the great engineer, stood by helpless during our worst economic calamity. Hard times, ugly times. America was fouled by bad feelings. The campaign of 1928 was marked by anti-Catholic bias and its smears against Smith's urban background reflected intolerance of foreigners, impatience with dissent, and hatred rooted in religion and race. 
I came of age with the melody of old-time religion ringing in my ears. There was much in it, generous and redeeming. And my parents, although they came from a culture soaked with the evangelist Billy Sunday's diatribes against sinners, science, and liberals, were gentlefolk from whom I never heard a contemptuous word toward strangers. <laughs> Relatives, maybe, but not strangers. Still, it was the Bible Belt and some of the strictures of fundamentalism my father embraced as revealed wisdom. We heard so many sermons on demon rum that it was only a few years ago I was finally able to persuade him that if he were going to take the scriptures literally, he would have to honor that passage in the Bible which enjoins the faithful to use a little wine for thy stomach's sake. He did and does. I was lucky. There was in the 20s a nasty side of fundamentalism which infected America for time to come. Mixed with fears of the communist revolution in Russia, it inspired a rebirth of American nativism. Bigots and super patriots turned the melting pot into a boiling kettle of racial and religious antagonisms. Jews, Catholics, and blacks were its chief victims, but vigilantes might threaten anyone, student, professor, editor, writer, artist, anyone suspected of harboring subversive ideas. What's hardest to remember is that the 1920s arose out of bitter disillusionment. Our troops returned home after World War I, hoping to rebuild their lives. Instead, they faced unemployment, an economic depression, and labor unrest. A general strike shut down Seattle for days. Even the police struck in Boston. A huge walkout of steel workers was broken by police and private security guards in 50 cities across 10 states. And coal strikes were led by John L. Lewis's United Mine Workers. The coal companies won out. The union's membership dropped from a half million in 1920 to 75,000 in 1928. In the 20s, the union movement practically collapsed. Most of the union activity in the 20s was from groups that were left of center, like the IWW. Radical labor groups, like the Industrial Workers of the World, were blamed for the unrest. Many of its organizers were jailed. I joined the IWW on general principles in San Francisco in October 1922. I got arrested uh, when I came down from there and, and sent over to San Quentin for three years and four months for being an organizer. It was in the treatment of foreign radicals that America showed its most reactionary face. A red scare erupted in 1919 and 1920. Attorney General Palmer conducted huge raids to deport Bolsheviks, anarchists, and communists. The effects of the Red Scare lasted through the decade epitomized by the case of Sacco and Vanzetti, Italian immigrants and anarchists charged with robbery and murder in 1920. They received the death sentence. The establishment said they were fairly tried, but others claimed they were railroaded for their beliefs. The case became an international issue. We were picketing, we were demonstrating, and for a long time there was the hope that perhaps, you know, we could really save them. But after six years of appeals, both men died in the electric chair. It was a great, great tragedy when they were executed. And then we had uh, demonstrations to protest and vigils. And it, it was a very sad uh, period. The case remains one of the most controversial in our history. I guess we all didn't feel too sure that they were guilty. It seemed like just being radical seemed to smear them as much as anything else. We didn't think that they were murderers as they were pictured, but that if they got killed, they both got killed. Looking back, it's almost a relief to turn from Sacco and Vanzetti to another still echoing legal skirmish. Here's John Scopes, a high school biology teacher charged in Tennessee with teaching evolution. In 1925, state law made that a crime. In a packed courtroom, under the gaze of the media, Clarence Darrow defended Scopes. William Jennings Bryan, four-time presidential candidate, led the prosecution and defended fundamentalism. I think most of the people that were left to center enjoyed it for its uh, 
putting bigotry and uh, uh, on display that uh, it was a fight between the years gone by and the years to come. So packed was the courtroom that the trial was moved onto the lawn. There, Dara questioned Brian as an expert witness on the Bible. Dara exposed Brian's ignorance of science and challenged his religious beliefs. Eventually, the jury returned its verdict. Guilty. Brian had won his courtroom case, but he had lost in the court of public opinion. Exhausted and humiliated, he died less than a week later. You could tell the story of this decade in terms of victories won that were part illusion, part triumph. Consider the new woman. She could vote, but was still a second-class citizen. And if she marched off to work, as millions did, she marched when day's work was done right back into the kitchen, still considered her natural place in life. In matters more intimate, well, Freud and free love entered the vocabulary. And F. Scott Fitzgerald could write that none of the Victorian mothers had any idea how casually their daughters were accustomed to being kissed. So kissing and anything else, especially the unmentionable anything else, was not to be flaunted. The morality as I knew it in the 20s was um, nothing like free love. The liberated woman of that time liberated herself privately, if you get my meaning was not advertised much and often didn't let on when she went back to Dubuque, Iowa, that she was liberated when she was in Chicago. We didn't hear about uh, virginity. We didn't know the word, but had she done it, it was that kind of thing. And if she had done it, she would look down on. Whatever you did, you did not, you didn't have this, quote, honesty <laughs> that you have now, where you do what you want to do and didn't care who knew it. This wasn't the case. People might have been doing the very same thing, but it was a time of discretion. Discretion in relations between the sexes. As for relations between the races, half a century after emancipation, there still was little contact between blacks and whites, even among people of goodwill. I was never conscious of a black person until I got into high school. We had uh, an almost exclusively white community where I lived in Scranton. The only association we did have with blacks, as I say, as far as employing them for household work, that was my only contact. We didn't have very many blacks in New York at that time. I, at least I wasn't so conscious of them. We had no, no race relation problem. We didn't know them. That was it. When there was contact between the races, it was often hostile. A certain section of the city of Chicago, uh, they, they didn't lie. Uh, blacks in their neighborhood, and we didn't lie to whites in our neighborhood. The relationships uh, between blacks and whites uh, were on the basis of uh, master and servant, for example. Most of the blacks uh, who were around were in service positions like janitors, like, like porters, like uh, chauffeurs, like valets, uh, like waiters. Uh, and uh, flunkies around in the saloons and so forth and so on. We were completely segregated. No place to eat except the Union Station. And none of us afford, could afford the Union Station. There was no place in Chicago in the 20s and later than that where blacks could go and be accepted as whites were accepted. Despite obstacles, there were blacks who forged better lives for themselves. I was appointed uh, January 10th in 1919 uh, as the first black fireman in the uh, New York Fire Department. And the captain of the company retired forthwith because he didn't want the stigma of having the first black man uh, in uh, his company. And by them ostracizing me, not having anything to do with me, not speaking to me as if I was uh, an animal, uh, it only made me stay by myself because nobody have anything to do with me and i took the books and the rules and regulations and read up on them eventually wesley williams became the first black fire chief in new york city serving until 1952 
with distinction. Nothing tells us more about the confusing, hurtful 20s than the rebirth of the Ku Klux Klan. Founded in the bitterness of defeat in the South of 1866, it rose again in 1915. The Klan posed as the protector of old stock America and had one million members in 1921, almost half a million in Indiana alone, where it controlled elections. These counties in Indiana where they had uh, all the adults, every male adult, but maybe one or two or three, was joined the Klan because he terrorized them. I am the law in Indiana, said the head of the Indiana Klan. That was before he went to jail for raping and torturing a white woman. That was the beginning of the end for the Klan. Even a mass march through our nation's capital could not halt its decline. But the tail of the snake still wiggled and racism worked its will through the use of rope, gun, fire, and law. You would watch the paper to see who had been lynched and where was the lynching this morning. It was, it, it, we, it was not good. In the South, it was very bad. Throughout the decade, 281 blacks were lynched, each lynching different, each in its evil way the same. Poet Sterling Brown captured the terror and tragedy of a lynching in his poem, O Limb. I had a buddy, six foot of man, muscled up perfect, game to the heart. They don't come by ones. Outworked and outfought any man or two men, they don't come by two. He spoke out of turn at the commissary they gave him a day to get out the county. He didn't take it. He said, come and get me. They came and got him. And they came by tens. He stayed in the county. He lays there dead. They don't come by ones. They don't come by twos. But they come by tens. So the 20s had not two, but countless faces, some of them ugly and hateful. It's healthy to recognize the errors of our forebears, but also to realize that some people managed to do the best of things in the worst of times. And there were many acts of conscience by individuals who fought back against the repression of the time and kept strong the idea of decency and freedom. There were also those personal commitments which bonded men and women to one another and to their children. I'm the beneficiary of such vows, and so are many of you. No better evidence of how one age bequeaths to another its share of our collective history can be found than in those people who helped guide us through the 20s and to whom we now give our special thanks. Office worker. Singer. Poet. Attorney, merchandise advertiser, actress and author, composer, packing house butcher, telephone company worker, social worker, coal miner, Architect, garment worker, newspaper man, IWW organizer, elevator installer, garment worker, stockbroker, fireman. And finally, from their golden anniversary in 1976, my parents. I'm Bill Moyers.
This program has been brought to you by the people of Chevron, who have been helping to supply America's energy needs throughout the 20th century.